Auditorium was full. Yeah. Most people have an idea what the auditorium looks like. Yeah. yeah. People, I heard people say 400. I heard people say 500. Yeah. I imagine yeah. it was yeah. in that range. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I'll ask the fire. It's, isn't the so. capacity for... Yeah. They said 600 in the auditorium. Oh, okay. That's okay. what I was told. Yep. Okay. Well, well, so, pretty pretty cool. Cool. Uh, yeah. How's uh, how Calls me in order. The pledge. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This is for a short prayer from Captain Stacy. Lord, thank you for another day. And as we see the symbolism of love throughout this Valentine's holiday, may we all remember that your grace is what should guide us through at all times. Please be with us as we make the decisions on the best interests of the citizens of Seneca County. In your name we pray, amen. Roll call. Commissioner Thomas? Yes. Commissioner Kirshner? Commissioner Stacy. Here. All right, I'll accept a motion to approve the digital audio video recording of the previous board session from Thursday, February 7th. So moved. Second. Roll call. Commissioner Stacy? Yes. Commissioner Kirshner? Commissioner Thomas? Yes. Ken, do you want to go? I can go. <laughs> Not leave. <laughs> Not till 15 yet. So if you were expecting, no. you know, a more other, yeah, ponies for the show or anything. So. <laughs> I brought no ponies. More ponies. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I didn't bring ponies. Uh, anyway, I think you guys probably already received the enormous report that I wrote. I wrote a ten-page synopsis on our year in review and I'll just narrow that down to 18 slides four of which are pictures so I won't waste a lot of your time this morning um, the great thing about 2018 for Seneca County EMS was it was our 40th year in operation continuous service to the county 40 years a long time and uh, the volunteers I, I can't say enough about the volunteers because those are the guys that made it happen uh, you know so our biggest accomplishment from 2018 was obviously just getting through 40 years and uh, some of the guys that we have are still here uh, that, that have been here since 1978 and uh, when we had our big celebration uh, at the park last year in May uh, which we had that coincide with uh, EMS week which is a national um, EMS week set forth President Ford did that back in the <coughs> late 70s um, we had some of the original commissioners there that signed the original documents some of the original township trustees that were there that did that. The agreement that they signed in 78 is pretty very, very much similar to the one we still use today. And um, even back in the days before computers and satellites and all the things that we have now, they did a really good job of laying out our system. So currently what our mission is, is to support the mission of the ambulance districts that we've put together since 2013. Uh, the ambulance districts was a was a way that we decided to uh, help finance this situation when it comes to uh, uh, reimbursing or I guess you would say uh, compensating the volunteers for their time it doesn't really pay them but it gives them a little bit of money to help offset the cost of being a volunteer our mission for the next 40 years will be maintain and increase the standard of care as, as I don't even read them to you you guys are I'm sure uh, the EMS compass is a national um, movement that kind of, just as it says, the EMS compass kind of points the way towards where we need to be in EMS through the year 2050. Um, we're doing this thing in like 40 year increments. So in 1978, they started that. The EMS compass started in about 2015, and now we're pushing towards the EMS uh, agenda for 2050. Um, you can go to ems.gov and look at the federal guidelines for it. And that's what we're doing, maximizing our efficiency and meeting the recommendations set forth in that EMS assessment that was done for us in 17, which sets forth the, uh, gives us the best practices and the methods that work. And all we're trying to do is model successful behavior and take EMS to the next level. And I'll talk to you a little bit about how we're doing that here. If my clicker works. It did, and it worked too good. There we go. That was us back in 78, uh, and now the fleet today. So obviously those uh, 1978 Hortons, uh, some of those are 77s actually, the round headlight, I know you can't see it, it's a small picture, but 
There's square headlight ones that are 78s and there's round headlight ones that are 77s. And those things took us all the way up into the mid 90s. And they were good trucks. And then I don't have a picture of our fleet in the 90s. We didn't do that. And uh, now that's our current fleet today. Um, 2016 is our newest trucks. Our oldest truck is a 2008. Uh, we, we do have some older backups that are back in the 2005s and a 1995 one. But that's our current fleet, and that's what you see riding the roads today. Uh, this is uh, some just pictures of our staff, some of our guys out at the uh, Tiger Classic this last summer. A couple of our um, New Regal EMTs that have been with us for a very long time. I bet most of you probably know those young ladies. <laughs> and uh, some of our equipment over the years, we had someone do a project showing the then and now. Uh, that's, I think this is a pointer, but it doesn't work on a flat screen. Mm -hmm. The bottom right shows some of the ancient equipment as opposed to the new stuff we use today. And then a, a board that our guys put together for the fair. It was kind of neat to show all six of our squads. And then I'll get into the meat of this thing and we'll move forward. So in 2013, this board and me directed me to do that. Provide the go most cost-effective method of providing high-quality advanced life support pre-hospital care to the citizens of Seneca County to continue to support the current compensated volunteer EMS system and augment it with a full-time echo. We've done that. Uh, and I can say we've done it in spades. It's uh, very successful, and there's a lot of folks around the state that look at what we do and ask how we do it. Um, we're, we're not finished by any sense of the imagination, but what we're doing is very successful. Our ECHO unit started in 2008, uh, transitioned from part-time to full-time uh, in 2017, so we've been doing that full-time for two years now. This past year in 18, we went on 826 responses out of 1240, and our average response time to the scene was eight minutes and 36 seconds. Um, 536 patient encounters, 212 ALS transports. Um, these guys do a lot more than just run calls. They are our uh, hub for the volunteers to receive their supplies. They also do a, quite a bit of uh, daily maintenance, monthly checks, all the things we have to do to keep ourselves compliant with all the rules of any other healthcare organization. Med uh, medication expirations, uh, supply and re uh, resupply, and also education and training. That is our current ECHO unit. It's 2017 Ford F-150, and that's Darren Mack, our B-Shift paramedic. And uh, that was the day we rolled it out after getting the stickers put on it. We departed from the standard white and blue, uh, just to kind of make something that kind of stands out. And, and the good thing about that is it's a rolling billboard. The bad thing about that is it's a rolling billboard. So if you do something <laughs> stupid, somebody's going to know it's you. So uh, nobody does anything stupid, uh, not going to win. But uh, sometimes we are moving pretty quickly to get all the way across the county. Uh, for, we received four grants in 2018. Um, those are the totals. Our state EMS grant this past year was 8,900 bucks. I'm expect, expecting quite a bit more this year because um, they've changed the way grants are done. And I was involved with that through the state um, EMS board. And that, that, that's an honor to be a part of. Uh, the Seneca Just for Kids, we bought all new, brand new PEDS bags. That's that center picture is the pediatric bag. Those are color coded by weight and length. So sometimes we don't know the abs absolute weight of a child, so we estimate it by length and those are color coded so we have a tape that tells us what size equipment we use on pediatrics. Uh, pediatric runs can be very stressful as you can imagine so we try to simplify it as much as possible and that's a national standard and we utilize that. EMS tablet grant last year we received nine Samsung tablet computers that we use for documentation and also we use it to run our uh, I am responding software which is a little snippet of that on the left hand corner. That helps us uh, with mapping to the scene and also gives us uh, ETAs of our responders so that when our guys get on station, they know exactly how long they're gonna have to wait for their partner to show up. Works really good, but it's used nationwide and we use it to, to pretty good use here. Uh, we're still getting kind of the hang of it because there's a lot of things it'll do. It's pretty complex if you get all the way into the meat of it. And then we always take advantage of the workers' comp safety grant as often as we can. And that's how we purchased our auto pulses, which I have a demonstration video of that right here. 
Auto Pulse Mechanical CPR does CPR. Our guys can stay safely belted, and that provides superior circulation to the heart and brain. Um, one of the downsides of rural EMS is it takes us a while to get to the scene. So once we get there, we have to do everything to maximize efficiency with the minimum amount of people and also to do the best and provide the best medicine at the bedside. And if we can click that link, Nikki, this is a one minute video. Because I can't do that from this doohickey, I don't think. And I don't show any patients that we have. Uh, these are all simulations. Well, maybe. Yeah, it's, it's just got to open YouTube and do its thing. I already have it open on my screen, though. Hmm. Interesting. All right, well, we'll just pass that by, I guess. Actually, yeah, the video is kind of cool. <laughs> it shows how these things work, and it shows how uh, how quickly you can apply it, and how easily it uh, does its thing. Uh, this is done at a conference. See, it's still pulling up over here. Maybe All I can right. drop and drag it. Ooh, I don't know. You're talking stuff I'm not familiar with. I hear it. Yeah, and you can you can kill the sound on it if you want. Uh, it's mm, just a picture. There we go. Okay, so that is a mannequin, even though it does look pretty realistic. Uh, they're doing hands-on CPR. That's the traditional way of doing CPR. We've been doing that since uh, probably sometime around the mid-1920s. And uh, now they're preparing the equipment, which the thing he's got his hands on up there above the patient is the autopulse. And they'll stop on the count of 30, raise the patient up, slide the band around his chest, push a button, and CPR is happening. And it's doing circumferential pressure CPR, which is better medicine than the plunger style. Um, that's still being studied, so I say that, but um, we'll know in about 50 years. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so they secure him, and then off you go. And if you have four people, when you're lifting an actual patient, it works a whole lot better. And those things get up and down stairs a lot easier. Upstairs is, is really challenging on a backboard. So with this thing, it goes around corners. As long as the patient's still good and pliable, we can get them up and down stairs and secure them and out the door we go, and that's it. The carry apparatus is part of the... It is. The yeah, it's a, it's a mega motor. Yeah. Uh, okay. Big thing, hold 1,500 pounds if it has to. We hope to God it never has to, but, <laughs> but it can. All right, and uh, the county ambulances, like I said, they range in two, from two years of age to 23 years of age. Uh, our oldest backup is 23, and that thing runs better than most of them. And it has low miles, it's just got a lot of years on it. And uh, all, of our all of our ambulances have been uh, equipped with power load stretchers, which are auto lift and auto load. And we did that through a worker's comp grant. Um, Matt Gray is our maintenance technician. He's also echo paramedic, and he is probably a, one of the biggest assets that we have because he takes the time to um, do all the little maintenance things that need to be done and hardly anybody ever has time to do. And he takes the time to do it. Um, and we do maintenance every three times a year and, and more if we need to. And I'll show you how the power load works if you want to click that link. And that's a one minute video as well. This is also from a conference. This one's actually in Norway, so it's not even in English, but it's the best one I could find that was short. But this is the exact load system we have. I know the commissioners have seen this uh, demonstrated right out front here. It's, it's kind of chilly today to do that. so. So it comes out on a track system, and you, he's doing that with one hand. That cot will lift over 850 pounds, and it'll do that uh, all day long without hurting anybody's back or shoulders or, uh, <laughs> or, or, or anything else. And you see how the lift arms go down, and then you push one button, and it frees the system, and then away you go like so. And... And there's about a five second pause or 10 second pause and then he'll go back and reload it. Uh, this will, well, we already have some of the oldest EMS providers around. We got some guys well into their seventies that are still doing EMS because they love to give their, their, their community and I'm not gonna tell them no, as long as they're physically able to do it. This will make us physically able to do it for as long as possible because we don't have to do the lifting 
and the moving and all of the things that are very labor intensive of moving patients in a pre-hospital environment. And, and it is challenging. Uh, getting them to this point is the hard part. Once you get to the truck, you shouldn't have to work any harder. That's the way I look at it. So the way that lifts up, and you pull to you, and then off you go in. Like I said, 850 pounds. I've actually personally witnessed one of those lift over 1,000 pounds, and it worked. Didn't even, didn't even breathe heavy. But they don't rate them at that. They rate them at 850. So, yeah, that is our lift load system, and we've equipped all, all seven of our trucks with that. Six first run, and then Bascom's second truck. There we go. Our EMS education is something I'm very proud of. We provide over 90 hours a year of education to our providers. That is extremely important because as with any healthcare, or if you're an accountant, or if you're anything anymore, you have to have continuing education. So we provide it in-house. Uh, and we do that through a collaborative agreement with Mercy Health. And uh, they're their trauma program up there. Um, and also the, the Life Light program, which I'm very proud to be a part of, and that helps us in a, a lot of ways so we can do our own training without having to pay for it. Refresher training, which we're in the middle of right now, actually tonight is our last night of a 48-hour refresher that we began January 3rd. And um, those makes for some long Tuesdays and Thursdays. Can I get an amen from Danny? <laughs> so, yeah, those days are long 16-hour days for us, but they are worth it because we don't have to pay the big money to send them to a, a college or university to get that stuff. Uh, there is a lot of stuff available online and our guys take advantage of it, but we also provide 90 hours of hands-on stuff right here. This past year with grant money, we also bought the new CPR mannequins that meet the 2019 American Heart Association requirements for wireless and biometric feedback so that you know you're doing good CPR. Anybody who took CPR back in the early 80s used to have to cut the perfect strip. Well, we're back to that again, except now we do it with a computer. And uh, it works pretty good, and uh, they're heavy, but they work pretty good. Those are the numbers. 1,240 calls for service total. Had 574 refusals or not needed, meaning we show up and there's nobody there because they already left or it was a fake call. Uh, 17 DOAs, 826 echo responses. There's the breakdown of where we took them. We transported 694 patients and you'll see in the report at the end that there's a few more that we actually could bill for that we didn't transport because there's certain situations that we can do that for. Uh, this year we only flighted six patients from the scene. A lot of them got flown from the hospital after that. Our average is about 15 patients a year that we fly. This year it was only six. Um, could have been something due to weather, could have been a whole very, a variety of reasons, but six from the scene, which is actually down. The IM responding software that we purchased is a dispatch and call mapping software. It allows us to, whenever a call comes in, not only do they come across the pagers that we carry, it also comes across everybody's individual cell phone, and then it also goes directly to the tablet computer that's in the truck. So with one single button, you know who's coming, how long they're gonna to take to get there, and where you're going with a accurate drawn line on a map. It uses Google Map technology, works pretty good. Um, it also makes documentation a lot easier because you can get your times right away. You don't have to call if you, and it just, it's very accurate and accurate ma uh, mapping data. Kind of cut that off, sorry about that. We use health service integration or HSI for our billing service. They work at a 3.25% of collection, so that means they're performance based. So the more they bill and successfully collect, the more money they make. I found that that's actually a better way to do it because if you just pay a flat rate, then people just do what they do and don't care what happens because they're getting paid anyway. So if you do it at a performance base, you do a little better. Uh, it's got a really good desktop interface and I can't take anything away from Danny because Danny interfaces with this multiple times a day and she is the heart and soul behind our entire administrative process and I can't thank her enough for what she does for us. That's Danny right back there, if anybody wants to. <laughs> <laughs> she hates it when I do that. <laughs> so collection and payments. We began using the Attorney General's Office for collection of bad debt in 2018. Um, some of the most striking things are when you take a look at our books and you say, wow, you guys billed out a million dollars, but you only collected 350. What's up with that? That's medicine. Um, and that's why everything costs so much. No, don't, don't take my word for it. You can, you can look that up. So uh, 
We should see a marked increase in, in revenue collected because of the AG's um, dogged determination of collecting bad debt, and they're very good at it. So if you have gambling winnings or you get a tax return and you owe us money, we get ours first. That's kind of cool, actually. It's going to make some people not very happy with me. So I'm thinking about putting in for a bulletproof vest. <laughs> so uh, we're already receiving payments from that. And another thing we've done just this year, and it should go live here short. It's live now. We just have to do the marketing, which I may hit Jimmy Flynn up for some help on the marketing side of the GovPayNet, which is an online or credit card, or you can even call and make your payments. That way you don't have to write us a check. Since in this day and age with insurance companies issuing debit cards, this will make that a uh, more seamless process for the payments. And uh, you can even call a number. It's a completely automated thing. You put your number in and poof, your bill's paid. And we've had a lot of people come and ask us for this. So this is why we did this. So we're moving into the future. That is in a terrible slide, but we have those printed for anybody that's interested. No, nothing we do is a secret. Um, I can't even see that. You can see it bit better on my computer when I'm like this close to it. Um, some of the things that are obvious here, the bottom is the actual the whole year trailing 12 months. So you can see where our work is done. The Bascom truck did 339 transports and it went down from there. The next busiest uh, truck was Attica at 102. Uh, so Bascom does about 80 to 90% of our work at a Hopewell Loudon, and then they also cover Jackson and Liberty Township quite a bit. Uh, those aren't the actual call volumes, those are the people we transported. So that equals out to that number. And the, you guys can review those numbers in spreadsheet format, and that's just a PDF. Uh, basically, it shows you how much we, re we received, how much they billed and how much they received. The numbers are staggering, but uh, they're going to get better. So in 19, what I'm looking to do, and I've already done it, is recommending to the uh, Joint Ambulance District leadership to consider moving to a part-time pay structure, at least in some of the areas, the more busy areas, because it is very difficult to find true volunteers anymore. So uh, I know that they are looking into the HR component for that, and some of our township trustees at the Winter Conference um, attended a few seminars on how you do that because we're not the first people to have to move to a part-time or full-time system of EMS. Uh, but what we're very proud of is we, our system as it's currently working is working great. And all the components are currently right now in place to move to a full-time or part-time or part-paid or full-time paid system as, uh, as needed. Everything's there. All we need to do is get that HR component involved. And I'm not going to stand here and tell you that's, that's a cheap process because the human resource is the most valuable resource and it is also the most expensive resource. So that concludes my little presentation. The complete document is available. It's a 10-page report and it'll be available online after today at our website, which is right there, SenecaDPS.org. And you can read it at your leisure, or if you want to take a nap, we'll put you to sleep. That's all I got. Thank you for coming. Do you want to Thank talk you. about the WENS? WENS. Yeah, WENS, our wireless emergency networking system, which uh, is managed by the EMA side of our office. And um, that is a service that we provide to the county in both cities that we all three pay for it. And it, it'll provide automated national weather service um, alerts to your cell phone. It'll even do voice calls to your house phone if you want. And it'll also do it by email. Um, it, it also allows us as emergency services folks to identify people in an area if we need to evacuate or have you stay shelter in place. Um, without a system like this, we would have no other way of mass notification other than sending firefighters or, paramet or uh, police officers door to door knocking on the door saying, hey, there's a I don't know, insert emergency here going on, please stay in your home. Uh, so this is more effective. Um, currently we have about 3,600 subscribers. I'd like to see that be about 10 times that because it would be more effective the more people there are. Uh, some of the questions well, that we were- We started at zero, so- We did, and we moved- A year ago, so, yeah. I mean- How do you, yeah. how do you subscribe? You subscribe by texting Seneca Alerts, exclamation point, to the number 69310. And if it gets annoying, you can text STOP to 
to 69310. <laughs> and we don't actually inundate you with alerts, but it will send you out a level one, level two, level three, as the sheriff dictates that. So when he sends us the notification to do that, we push it out using WENS. Uh, we're not as fast as some people. Um, some of the Facebook websites are, at, or uh, whatever they're called, Facebook pages are absolutely amazing in the speed that they can get this stuff out. They're out within 45 seconds of the sheriff issuing it. And I don't know how they do that, because I can't do that. <laughs> but uh, I can send those alerts from my phone. All the fire chiefs can send it from their phones. The sheriff can send it. Um, the administrator of uh, both cities and the, and the county can send messages. Um, and we've used it, like if there's a house fire and we have a block of road, we'll say this road is blocked between here and here due to a fire or an emergency. Um, and that's good information to have if you're traveling. If you're driving down the road and you always take this road home, you get an alert, not that I'm saying you should text and drive, but you, know, you get an alert that says, hey, this road's closed, then you know, hey, I can't go that way. That doesn't stop anybody, usually, but at least you know. <laughs> so uh, WENS is a very robust system, and it, it is utilized by a lot of departments for a lot of different things. We can use it for notification of uh, individual department heads. We can use it for individual people. Um, but its design and what it really is good at is notifying a bunch of people really, really fast. Because we can push out 3,000 text messages in about a minute. And uh, it would take a team of teenagers to do that in that amount of time, you know, wear mm -hmm. out some thumbs. But it, it works pretty good. And um, we use it, the National Weather Service alerts push straight out from Cleveland, uh, the Cleveland office of the National Weather Service. We don't control them. Uh, so when the flash floods were happening last week, <laughs> man, like six people, you get like six messages. And I had to call them. I'm like, I have no idea why this is happening, but you're making my phone ring and I'd really appreciate it. So they were like, oh, well, every time, because the National Weather Service uses antiquated software, doesn't mean it's bad, just means old. And every time they enter into that alert, they enter into it and they change it. They're like, well, now it's also including Wyandotte County. So they add Wyandotte. As soon as they hit update, it pops out another alert. Anytime they enter into that page, and they do that every hour during a watch to update it. Every time they do that, it sends it out. So I learned how to temporarily stop those from happening. So hopefully, hopefully that won't happen again. Uh, but we're learning. We've only had the system for a year, but it is a great system. And there's some good information on the commissioner's website, our website, and, and it was also in the media. We pushed this out pretty uh, wide and pretty far so everybody can. And you can adjust your alerts. If all you want is weather, that's all you need to get. Uh, and if there's a national emergency, FEMA has the ability to push alert to everybody's phone at any time for anything. So whether you sign up or you don't sign up, you still get Amber Alerts, terrorism alerts, uh, or any major event, you'll, you'll get that. Those are presidential, and they come down through FEMA. What well, else again, we, we, we appreciate all the work that all the coordinators do, the EMS coordinators and all the volunteers. It's you know, a real point of civic pride to have these ambulance districts and have it, the volunteers and commitment that we have from everybody. So you know, we do appreciate it. Goes, it goes is. Forward. I'm just the dancing chicken. The, all the work goes into the guys out there in the field, and they do a heck of a job. Better said than they I do could have said it myself. They do. <laughs> <laughs> can you feel the love? I can feel it. it is Valentine's Day. It is, right? So, you know, but our guys have been doing it for a very long time, and they're very proud of what they have. And uh, they wouldn't change a thing. Uh, I know that they, if we offered them money, they would take it. Yeah. However, they're doing it because it's their community. And uh, one of my favorite and one of the best paramedics that we have is Bob Farrell from the Republic area. He's been here since he was a teenager in the 70s. And he's, when you ask him, you're like, Bob, are you running EMS tonight? He goes, well, I'm not working and I'm going to be home. Of course I'm running. What? Why wouldn't I be running? <laughs> he doesn't even understand what you mean when you ask him if he's going to be on because he's always on duty, always. And that, that's a mindset. It's not a not a task to him it's just the way the world works so thank you for your time thank you thank i can't you. say enough about them and i really appreciate your guys support for all we do thank you it's been two full years since we've had 24-hour echo yes yeah before that we had 12-hour 
yep. for almost 10 years. Benny. <laughs> I was just going to comment that you know, um, Ken and I started at the fire department within a couple months of each other and Tiffin and in that 25 year span the greatest innovation in my opinion in EMS in saving patients without a pulse in saving any patients I mean we went years where you know we get these calls and we just the CPR just couldn't maintain but with the auto pulse and the you know the Lucas machines that we implemented, we our save rate went through the roof, and they're just incredible pieces of equipment. And um, yeah, that's a great asset to the county. You you know those numbers are going to just yep. continue to improve. Good. You want to say the executive session till the end? Yep. Okay. Any adjustments to the agenda? I don't get any. Okay. County administrator. Course. 13 years in one week. <laughs> <laughs> yep, you're right. A uh, couple things. Um, the courts have, uh, I think from uh, Judge Meyer's court administrator, sent out an email. According to the Supreme Court of Ohio um, superintendent, rules of superintendent, they are uh, putting together a court security committee uh, which is spelled out, uh, committee should include representatives of first responders, emergency management agency, the funding authority, and uh, may include representative from each entity within the courts. Basically, it's because we have all the courts in one building, uh, so they got to all get together and do that. Uh, they asked for a representative, obviously, from our office. I said, you know, I would be there if the commissioners wouldn't be able to be there. Um, so they have scheduled their first meeting um, on March 25th at 9 o'clock. I did put it on the um, calendar so you guys would see that. But I thought I'd just explain that a little bit. Because um, I think kind of the sheriff and had been doing the court security before. But he is included in this and he's included um, currently Mike Clace, our EMA director. So they've got a lot of people involved and in offering to sit on that committee. So. I think we just need to be there in case they want some money. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, a couple reports. Um, I don't think I had uh, uh, brought up the Medicaid fund update, so just wanted to say where we were at on that. We're not getting any more on that, but our uh, balance of that fund is $885,046.71. Uh, the budget stabilization fund, uh, which we will, you know, anticipate adding to, is that it is at 375,000. Our current uh, sales tax, which I don't have um, February's in yet, so this is just January's, uh, 680,705.44 cents. That is including both a half a percent and the one percent which it appears slight higher higher than it was in 2018. So that's you know a good sign starting out, but that's two two months behind, so that would be November's shopping sprees, I guess. <laughs> um, Justice Center, obviously it's done up and running. We got the official final um, occupation uh, certificate of use and occupancy. The official one we've been working with a temporary occupancy but we actually got the final certificate so that's good uh, the fund still has a remainder of about 248,000 the only bills that are outstanding is the furniture uh, cotton metal they had a few items that were still back ordered and uh, were, should have come in yesterday and then uh, all those all the bills should be covered <coughs> under the justice center should be wrapping up and done. We were hoping to get it completely done by the end of 18, and it was other than just a couple pieces of furniture that hadn't come in yet, so we will get those wrapped up soon. Um, there was a question on the uh, auction that I forgot to ask when we passed the uh, contract last week. I need to know if we want to do an absolute auction or a reserve auction. Uh, the auctioneer had recommended a no reserve uh, or obsolete absolute action auction. 
uh, to get more in attendance. So we um, need some guidance on that. And and otherwise, we do have a three percent. No, uh, this is six percent, or a minimum fee of three thousand. Okay. So um, I guess to cover that cost, we need uh, you know fifty thousand dollars for that building to cover the three percent or the six percent or three thousand. Um, I kind of yield to their advice in the profession, and that was to not have a reserve. Okay. No going back now. No going back now. We're not putting the wall library there. <laughs> <laughs> or a storage facility. Right, there. right. Hopefully. And we'll have, uh, as soon as I get this back to him, then we'll set a date. Great. So, Thanks. just got to check with his schedule to see what he's got already set up for there. Um, the only other thing, uh, I think Nikki had asked about uh, looking at May schedules. I know we set, went ahead and sent, set up uh, Thursday schedules through April. Uh, the engineer had called Nikki and asked for a couple bid dates in, in May. Um, so uh, I think we kind of are looking for some guidance on where we want to go through May. Yeah, <clears throat> you know, obviously we don't have Mike here, so that's, that's a little um, difficult. But I think May 2nd and May 9th, those Thursdays both work for me. Okay. So I, I think I'm comfortable setting those if Holly's okay with yeah, that. Yeah, those are fine with me. And then uh, if you want something later in April, I know Tuesday, April 30th works for me. Okay. So that would be, be, a, yeah, be a possibility. Uh, May 16th probably as a Thursday works, but it's also the uh, Ohio Power Siding Board hearing, and I don't know that we'll, oh. we'll get drawn into that or not, but um, that's just what's on the calendar for that day. So I'm, I'm, I'm confident in the 30th, the 2nd, and the 9th. Okay. And yeah. The 30th is a Tuesday. Looking at the calendar, it doesn't appear Mike's got anything on the calendar. So. Okay. So, so, Put it on that Thursday, and if we need the Tuesday, we'll add it. But um, we'll just do the, the Thursdays. Okay. Um, and then the other, it's talking about schedule. Um, we never really set anything for work sessions. Do you you want to put those on our schedule, or just try to do them as an ad needed basis? Because we didn't really talk about setting a specific schedule for those. Um, as well as we didn't do the quarterly evening meetings commit to whether we we're doing those or not. Right. The intent was we, we, we would still do, do those, still but do those. Okay. Gotta, um, I got to go through the calendar and see where we would fall at. Yeah. For I don't know how that will or will not conflict with the building agenda or township meetings being Thursday because I think mm -hmm. every night but Friday there's probably some township or village meeting. Okay. So. So think about it, and then um, yeah, and yeah, we might here. We can have that conversation okay. as well. Okay. But I'm, I lean towards work <laughs> sessions as needed, okay. as opposed to just scheduling them and trying to work in an evening meeting whenever we can. Okay. I think I, you know, we, we're on a pretty good rotation. We just got busy, so. Okay. All right. I think that's all I have. Uh, commissioner reports. I didn't write, write anything down. I got a couple things. So congratulations to the Chamber of Commerce for a great event oh. Saturday, and thank you to the staff for going. It was a lot of fun. Uh, we didn't win, but we had fun, so we won. Paid for private funds. Paid for by, yeah, not county funds. This but uh, <laughs> speaking of county funds, uh, I would like to suggest to bring up that uh, CSEP meeting is coming up. And I would like to suggest that the, the county have a, a table right. and that, uh, you know, we invite staff and other electeds to fill a table of eight, okay. just as a show of support. Thank you. So, I think you have a problem with that? Um, nope. Mm -hmm. And I think I can schedule on, or reserve it online? Yes. The table? Okay. And that's all I want to say. I didn't have anything else? Nope. Okay. Good. Uh, old business, parking study. So we uh, helped pay for a parking <laughs> study, participated in what seemed like a glacial period of participation in 
parking analysis with Gossman. They did a great job. Uh, we've gotten those recommendations. We've had some chance to look at them. Uh, we're asked, the city of Tiffin has accepted the report yes. in form, uh, not necessarily adopting the recommendations, but ad right. a, a, a adopting the, the form that it, it's complete, it's done, it can go on the shelf and it can be worked on. Uh, so that's what we're asking for today. David, you want to add anything to that? Yeah, no, correct. And I, you know, I think the, uh, the report itself doesn't say do this or this. It says think about these things. And if you're thinking about this, you might want to look at this. And so yeah, so by, by accepting it, it allows us, if uh, the parking committee or other organizations, the county or the city individually, would like to go do a project and go after grants, it can be used because it's been officially adopted by the county. Yet. So this is a, a step. What will happen after this is we will uh, work to, uh, to, to get back with the parking committee. And now that both political entities have accepted it uh, and to see what our next steps are. So it is a, it is a you know, slow, I, I like the word glacial because it's big and momentous <laughs> and a lot of, you know, great things happening. But uh, this is the, uh, what do you call it, the wheels of, of uh, government. But they do turn. And so appreciate the county support for the study. Um, as well as the judges and the city, and so we're excited to take the next step. I will move that we accept the parking study. Second. Roll call. Commissioner Stacey? Yes. Commissioner Kushner? Commissioner Thomas? Yes. And thank you to TSAP for coordinating that, and uh, you know, one of the better things that fell out of that parking study process is uh, some ideas that we're going to follow through with Gossman on, so you never know where these things are going to lead. Okay, speaking of TSEP, uh, Tiffin Seneca Economic Partnership, uh, again, moving maybe on a geological timeline. Got <laughs> 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 to come up with a better metaphor. Like a dig. Like a dig. That was a dig. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I spun the other one in the uh, We've been sure talking about this for order. some time, and I think through... Uh, David's patience and hard work, we've come to what I believe is a, an agreement, uh, but uh, I guess I would make a motion that, that we accept the contract and then we can have some discussion if you like. I will second the motion. So, and discussion. Thoughts? No, glad we're there. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think it ended up in a good place. Yes. So excited about yeah. it. I think, yeah. I think so. And, you know, again, as I said in recent speaking um, to groups about what we accomplished in 18 and we're talking about things going on in 19 is that this formalized the process for us with both economic development organizations by having the written contract mm -hmm. and it also ties in that direct piece to to know that you know we are very interested in economic development across the entire county mm -hmm. um, and we've got two groups helping that happen yeah, absolutely. So I appreciate the hard work. I think it, Thank you. It begins the, the formation of a true partnership, and we'll see results in the villages and townships that you know maybe we, we didn't see before. Mm -hmm. And this is an increase in the commitment from the county. So we are not taking anything away from the city and the, the efforts that are going on there. So uh, this is uh, incremental new adventure. With Thank incremental you. new services that will be provided, so we're excited. Roll call. Commissioner Stacy. Yes. Commissioner Kirshner? Commissioner Thomas. Yes. And just to note, uh, Commissioner Kirshner has been involved with David on this contract negotiations and talks, so he's fully up to speed on this. Uh, and this is, we would normally say something like this until all three of us were here, but he has been fully engaged, so... Uh, the discussion has been had. <laughs> New business. Um, just to tie a little bit to the TSEP contract, um, initially we put in the our normal contribution of 17000 in our budgets. Uh, I think the first session we had at the beginning of the year, we put in an additional fifty because I did not have a final number on what we're doing. So the final was the 89000 that's in the contract. So uh, we will be putting in a new supplemental appropriation for the additional amount, probably the next board session. Okay. Uh, just wanted to make sure I added that. Uh, the only 
financial I have is for the wireless 911 fund uh, it's a supplemental appropriation. This is for the um, the 911, the next generation 911, the contract we had in place. All this is doing is reappropriating it because the project obviously wasn't complete. We're waiting for the fire to be, get, be done. We paid all of 2018's uh, bills, so they reduced their certificate of funds and now they need to put the certificate back in place for 2019. So the supplemental is $353,389.04. Um, I have a resolution authorizing the disposal of unneeded, obsolete, or unfit county owned property. It's the 2010 Crown Victoria on the behalf of the Sheriff's Office. This one was, um, this one of them that was sold on gut deals. Oh, this is the, this is actually one that uh, was in the accident on, uh, in Fostoria. On January 24th, and uh, the car was determined to com complete the total loss. Uh, we will be getting insurance uh, money uh, from the company, and then additional. I think uh, the sheriff got 250 from Danners uh, for the car. <coughs> uh, and his, the other Crown Vic was a 2011. Um, this was also involved in an incident. This was back in December 2000. 2018, um, one of the sheriff deputies was rear-ended. Uh, the, the person in the other car, the other insurance, uh, is covering that. Um, they paid for the storage, the towing, and given us a check. They told me yesterday the check was on the way. It's uh, around $3,400. So. Um, I have a resolution appointing David Zach, Steve Painter, and Chris Schaefer, Schaefer to the Tax Incentive Review Council for Seneca County, Ohio, for the Rural Enterprise Zone. They have the expiration. Is that annually? Yes. Yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> um, I have a resolution amending the board's orders of January uh, 15th. January 15th. Oh, yeah, January 15th. Resolution 19 uh, 21, setting time, date, and place to receive sealed bids for the School of Opportunity Improvement Project. Uh, they had some addendums and questions, very good questions that came from prospective bidders. And so they asked to push back the bid opening. It was originally set up for today. Um, that they went ahead and put out uh, the addendums and pushed back the opening. So now it will be Thursday, February 28th at 10.30 a.m. here at the commissioner's office. Um, I have a resolution approving the bonding company and the bond for Julie A. Atkins, elected a Seneca County Auditor for term expiring March 10th, <coughs> 2023. And I have a resolution approving the bonding company and the bond for Paul Harris, appointed as Seneca County Treasurer, term expiring September 6th of 2021. And those are all I have. Move to accept the resolutions as presented. Second. Discussion? Roll call. Commissioner Stacey? Yes. Commissioner Kirsten? Commissioner Thomas? Yes. Okay. Time for public comments. Anything uh, be brought before the board? I want to thank our staff uh, and everyone who participated in the Sunny Farms Landfill Forum last night. Thank you for the media for being there and covering us. Um, we're, you know, we got a lot of good information. And you know, I expect good outcomes. I, uh, you know, sure. it's, it's a complicated process, and transparency is is vital. So, uh, good job for everybody putting that together. Jason Fire for being there. Tiffin City Schools for stepping up and and providing the venue. So, uh, a lot of people came together to make that information available. And I appreciate it. So, anything else for the, the good of the order? Okay, uh, we have a brief executive session oh, okay. to discuss personnel. personnel. Oh, 
I'll move that we go into executive session for the purposes of personnel. I don't expect any action, but uh, you're welcome to stay, but you're welcome to go. <laughs> we have a second that we need to go. Second. Commissioner oh. Stacy? Yes. Commissioner Kushner? Commissioner Yes. <laughs>